Coming up on Pet Heroes. By helping an injured neighbor, a dog pays forward the kindness once showed to her. And despite deafness and old age, a loyal dog rallies to save her beloved master. Hi, I'm Jason McCoy, and welcome to Pet Heroes. We often struggle to overcome or adapt to physical disabilities, especially when they occur suddenly or later in life. But how do animals react to similar challenges? Well, here are two inspiring stories of disabled pets and their actions under pressure. Hal and Julie Taylor live in Atlanta, Georgia, but spend every second they can at their cottage on Lake Rabin, just two hours north. We've been in Raven County about seven years in our weekend home. Julie and I come up every weekend and enjoy the uh, outdoors. County, Julie and I like to water ski, uh, like to hike, kayak, and particularly we like to cycle both the uh, mountain bikes and road bikes. Hal and I love coming up here to Lake Raven because there's a lot of national forest, and there aren't as many people here. The ones that are here, though, are very friendly, and they're very welcoming. Michael and Kim Crow live a mile down the road. They're Hal and Julie's closest neighbors. Okay. My wife, Kim, and my daughter, Elizabeth, we've lived here for eight years. I'm a volunteer firefighter. We have a uh, boat rental business here on beautiful Lake Raven, and um, a couple of other endeavors that keeps us busy, especially during the winter months. The Crows have five dogs, Lizzie, Ella, Socks, Sadie, and Ginger. Uh, we nicknamed them the uh, Lake Raven uh, Welcoming Committee. They're uh, very all, all very gentle dogs. Michael and Kim's dog, Ginger, is famous among Lake Raven residents for her outgoing personality. Ginger is very spunky, uh, personable, very, very, very gentle, endless supply of energy. I guess she's just good with all, all people and other dogs. She's almost like you can see her think. I know what she's thinking sometimes. And, um, but that's one of the most special things, I guess, about Ginger is she's very loyal. But in 2008, Michael and Kim almost lost Ginger. She was chasing a a squirrel and ran across the road and got hit by a car. We tied her leg off and took her directly to our vet and he amputated her leg. Now she's back up and running and um, <laughs> she's just as fast on three legs as she was for the four. Ginger is an extremely friendly dog. She's also an extremely intelligent dog. Never has met anyone she's afraid of. Never has met anyone that uh, she doesn't like. Whenever Hal goes biking, Michael and Kim's dogs, along with other local canines, are never too far behind. Usually we will start off with six or seven dogs following me, and Ginger will be the only one that, uh, that lasts through the ride. Hal's always happy to have Ginger by his side, but there's one ride he remembers more than any other, taken on January 9th, 2010. It had been extremely frigidly cold in Georgia for over two weeks at that point. My wife, Julie, and her friend, Susan, had gone to Franklin, North Carolina to go hiking. Before she left, one of the important things is she told me to leave a note uh, if I was gonna go out anywhere about where I was going to go. I also had some new winter biking clothes and I wanted to test those. Hal writes a quick note for Julie telling her he's heading out for a ride. That day I rode up my driveway and onto the gravel road. There was a light dusting of snow on the ground, so there's very few people out. Hal hasn't gone too far before he notices he's got familiar company. Michael and Kim's dog, Ginger, takes her usual spot at Hal's side. I got on the gravel road and uh, looked down, and there was Ginger.
So we proceeded to uh, Ginger and I up for service road number two. The road is a remote eight and a half mile stretch of rugged terrain. Between the snow and, and what I thought was a light frost on the ground, we went across an area that, that was not light frost, it was actually ice. And I had never ridden my mountain bike in that type conditions. As Hal speeds over a hidden patch of ice, he loses control and comes crashing down against the rock hard terrain. Ginger, of course, was immediately on me, licking me, seeing what was going on. Hal's feet are clipped into the pedals, causing his body to twist as he falls. So I said, well, the first thing I need to do is get out of that pedal. I tried, of course, to move my leg, and my leg wouldn't move, so I had to take my hands and twist the leg out of the pedal, disengage the cleat. That was a pretty upsetting thing to do, actually, because uh, I knew at that point the bone was not connected to, uh, to my hip anymore. There was no traffic on the Forest Service Road because there was snow and ice on it, and it was the dead of winter in Raven County. Hal's injuries are debilitating and have left him unable to move. If he's going to survive the freezing cold temperatures, Ginger may be his only hope. Hal Taylor suffers a brutal crash while cycling through the hills surrounding his weekend home. His hip is broken and the temperature is dropping fast. His only hope right now is Ginger, a three-legged dog with a huge heart. So I fell at one o'clock and I knew I had left a note for Julie but Julie was in Franklin, North Carolina with her friend Susan. So it was probably gonna be four hours minimum before Julie got home. So there I was with my cycling clothes, a little damp from the fall, a broken hip, and ginger. The snow and ice under Hal has melted away, making his clothes wet and drawing away vital body heat. He struggles to move, but quickly realizes that with his injuries, he's not going anywhere. Paramedic Trevor Stevens knows the dangers that Hal's facing. The circulation that goes through the hip here, it actually comes and branches out, goes down either leg. There's quite a bit of nerve bundles and large blood vessels that travel through that area. And anytime we get a dislocation and or fracture, there is a potential to compress those. A worst case scenario, it could uh, lead to a loss of limb. Ginger stayed with me the entire time. Quite frequently, she would come over and, and I would grab her and hold on to her and we'd both sit there and kind of huddle and stay warm together because I couldn't go anywhere. I was over a mile from a, from a road and I was there was just no way I could move. Dr. Connie Varnigan teaches advanced courses on the human-animal bond. It's no surprise to her that Ginger stuck by Hal's side. A companion dog is not going to leave someone who needs that type of support. She doesn't necessarily know that he's injured his hip, but she knows that he's injured. He's obviously in shock. He's cold, he's stressed, he's upset. So uh, Ginger stays with Hal because that's what she knows what to do. That's her instinctual behavior. Not only did Ginger stay with me the whole time, she would go to either end of the switchback. She would go to the far end and she would bark. When she first started doing it, I thought she heard somebody, so I'd start yelling. What Hal comes to realize is that Ginger hasn't actually found help, but is valiantly seeking it. Unfortunately, her efforts are in vain. Meanwhile, three hours after her husband's accident, Julie finishes her hike. We came back to the car, and I checked my phone to see if I had a message. And I was surprised that I hadn't heard from Hal because it was about 3.30. It takes Julie an hour to arrive back home, and still no word from Hal. I came in the house, and I saw the note, and it said 1 o'clock was when he left. And at that time I got home, it was about 4.15. So I knew there was a problem. Julie quickly hits the road, launching a desperate search. Meanwhile, Hal struggles to fight off hypothermia as the temperature plummets. Uh, in this situation, the most critical danger Hal has, I think, is 
the temperature. He's at the moderate stages of hypothermia with significant shivering. Uh, and the wet clothes will draw heat away from the body 25 times faster than what air will. So he will become hypothermic faster than he would if he was just you know, standing up with a cold wind. As I lay up there, I was thinking, what if Julie gets in a car accident or uh, has a flat tire or decides to stay later in Franklin? I went on the part of the road where the truck would go, and I was hoping to see him walking, pushing his bike home, and I got all the way to where the trail went into the woods, and I did not see him. But what was very alarming to me, and it really hit me and made me very emotional, when I started to drive up the Forest Service Road, I saw the tracks of his bike. And I said, there's his tracks. Oh, please let me find him. And I was hoping the tracks would not go off a ravine. So I headed up the road and around one of the switchbacks, I saw him lying in the road with Ginger, both of them huddled together. And I immediately stopped and checked on him, and the first thing he said was, blanket in the truck, blanket in the truck. Hal is in shock and is extremely cold. And with his shattered hip, Julie is unable to pull him to the warmth of the truck. As the day progressed, I actually called Julie and Hal at, at their house to see if Ginger was down there. Well, there was no answer, so I kind of figured it. Well, she was out at visiting another home on the lake, which she does often. I need an ambulance. As a volunteer firefighter, Michael is always on call for emergencies. I guess it was about 5 o'clock that afternoon, sun going down, and uh, my fire radio went off for an emergency call on Forest Service Road 2. And I immediately knew that that was Hal. He had gotten the message and uh, was the first one up there. And uh, believe me, I was glad to see Michael. And I'm sure Ginger was, too. Okay. Michael radios for help, which is soon on its way. Hal's core temperature is dangerously low. He's rushed by ambulance to Atlanta, where he's treated for his injuries. So I was thrilled to know he was alive. Ginger was Hal's little angel on that day. Fortunately, Hal made a full recovery. He believes Ginger's loyalty and dedication to him on the mountain was the result of her own experience following the loss of her leg. I think she remembered the care that she received, and I think I was a recipient of that on January the 9th when she was with me. That care that she received from Michael, I think, was transferred over to me. To have the intuition and the protective nature to stay with him in an incident like that, she's definitely a hero in my eyes. If your role is to be a companion animal, you're gonna bond with many humans. It doesn't mean that they're any less bonded with their owner, it's just that they have bonds with many, many, many humans, not just one. Our relationship with Ginger has, has grown even stronger since then. She was there that day when I couldn't be there, and she kept him warm when I wasn't there. And I really appreciate her for that, and I'm very, very happy of the special relationship that she and Hal have, because I also see how Hal smiles when Ginger comes running up to him as well. Ginger was in for the long haul that day, and uh, I think if I were still up there, she'd still be up there with me. I think Ginger's a true hero. Next on Pet Heroes, a woman and her beloved dog awake to find themselves facing a deadly threat. We just saw how a three-legged dog named Ginger was vital to Hal's survival following a debilitating fall from his bike. Next, we look at the story of Sophie, an elderly dog who still has a nose for trouble. Ann Fenimore lives in Eureka, California. I moved from Los Angeles about 22 years ago. I was a special ed teacher in LA and got a job here. It's a beautiful place to live, and I've never regretted moving here. 
Sophie is Anne's constant companion. Sophie is a Chow Australian Shepherd mix, and she's 14 years old. She was this perfect dog for me. Sophie's favorite place is by Anne's side, but she's not what you would call an overly affectionate dog. Sophie does not sleep on my bed. She doesn't cuddle with me. She just wants to be near me. I guess she just does not see any need to pay any attention to other people. Colleen Dixon and her dog Toby live in a studio apartment behind Anne's house. Colleen and Anne have been friends for almost 30 years. After Anne moved up here, I came to visit her for a number of years and decided I really loved the area. And I, in 1993, moved up here permanently myself. Colleen remembers when Sophie first came into Anne's life through an animal rescue. When I first met Sophie, Anne brought her to my house before she adopted her for a little preview. And I told Anne, this is the dog for you. She's perfect, and she has been perfect. When she came to live with us, she was very timid. She was head shy, hand shy. I think she'd been abused. It took a long time for her to stop being so timid. Sophie! Sophie! About a year ago, I noticed she just didn't respond to things this clearly. And sometimes I'd have, when I touch her or call her name, if I just touched her, she'd sort of bolt awake. Anne realizes that at 13 years old, Sophie has gone deaf and it's had an effect on her behavior. Sophie is no longer always at Anne's side. Since she's lost her hearing, she will either pay a great deal of attention to me or no attention to me. <laughs> I used to work with deaf children and if they didn't want to hear you, they just closed their eyes. And she seems to have that attribute too. June 18th, 2011 seems like any other night. Anne heads to bed, unaware that she's about to face a deadly threat. Sophie takes her usual spot on the floor. Around 10 o'clock at night, I smelled smoke. I smelled something burning. Colleen searches the area connecting her apartment with Anne's house. And I couldn't see any smoke. I couldn't see a place where smoke was coming from, but I smelled something burning. Unable to locate the source of the smell, Colleen goes back inside, unaware that disaster is about to strike. I was sound asleep, and all of a sudden, I felt her in my face all the way up on the pillow, nuzzling me. And I just pushed her away, you know, God, leave me alone, I thought, you know, I'm tired. And she jumped right back on the bed and did it again. Sophie, sensing danger, refuses to let Anne drift back to sleep. Finally awake, Anne mistakes Sophie's pleas for help as something else. I thought, well, there's a raccoon in the house. We, we had a resident raccoon who was living upstairs for a while, you know, and I thought, oh, another raccoon. But Anne is about to find out that it's something much worse. I stepped out of my bedroom and immediately walked into just this thick smoke. Most deaths due to fire or as a result of asphyxiation from smoke inhalation. If you are asleep, the smoke will not wake you up. When we're asleep, we don't have a sense of smell, so there's nothing in your olfactory sense that will uh, trigger you to wake up. Anne rushes over to Colleen's house. She needs to wake her up before the fire spreads. It was sometime after midnight, Anne started pounding on my door and was screaming which really just jarred me right awake. And I opened the door, and she said that there was a fire, there was, her house was on fire. So I called 911, who transferred me to the fire department. It took them a long time to put it out. 
especially under the house. There was, there was fire under the house and in the walls. The fire department is never able to determine what started the blaze, but they know what the outcome could have been. They said that if, if I had not awakened earlier and if the fire had reached the roof, which is all wood slate, the whole house would have gone. Now, Sophie always stayed next to Anne, even in the kind of hysteria of the moment at, at my house calling the fire department. Sophie was right there. The loss of Sophie's hearing may have made her less attentive to Anne, but on the night of the fire and every night since, she's remained by Anne's side, allowing Anne to finally begin teaching Sophie sign language, proving you can teach an old dog new tricks. Even in light of a disability, our bond is so tight with our companion animals, particularly our dogs, that animals can easily overcome their disability to maintain this bond and to support the humans who they are tightly bonded with. Sophie is, is definitely my hero. She's, she's my closest companion. Um, I take her everywhere with me, and she expects to go everywhere with me now. I can't even imagine another dog because she's the perfect dog. For Sophie, the loss of her hearing meant that she had to pay more attention to Anne, and it's a good thing she did. Anne could have easily been trapped in a deadly house fire. As for Ginger, she never allowed the loss of her hind leg to dampen her spirit or slow her down, which for Hal meant that she was by his side when he needed her the most. Ginger and Sophie are great examples of just how resilient and helpful our disabled pets can be. For more information, visit CM.